my name is uh, Matt Benner. Um, this is my fleet, the ISD Tyrant, the Constrictor, and the Aggressor, sort of three Star Destroyer type ships. Um, the first one I built was the ISD Tyrant, and it's uh, about 35,000 parts. It has a three level interior, and I guess I'll try to take it apart for you. Okay, yeah, that would be amazing. <laughs> so you can remove each module to reveal each level of the interior. On top, you have the uh, conference room, like a Sith chamber. Um, Now, since this one was the first one I built, it has a couple parts of it that aren't that user-friendly, so it takes a little while to take it apart. <laughs> you learn as you go along with these types of builds, are the best way to, to handle exactly. it. So the, the new one, the Aggressor, is much more user-friendly. It doesn't require this uh, hinges. Now I need an axle somewhere. you got to have the right tools for the job here. <laughs> All right, there we go. I have to move around. Oh, the bridge does have, there's an interior to the bridge, of course. And you got like the, the war plan room there? Yeah, like a conference room, and these are officer quarters. And, uh, there we go. So this level doesn't make a whole lot of sense in retrospect, but it was originally designed so there could be lights going through these foundation walls here. So they actually don't come off the ship, they're on hinges, so you could have wires going down to batteries in the bottom of the ship. Um, as it is, I took the lights out because they weren't very good. I might add a minute back in at some point, but um, as a result, since it's not completely removed, this comes apart in like five modules. It's gonna take a little time. We got like an armory. Got like a metal, medical bay over there. That's like ship operations, like the CIC. Um, it's like an evil medical bay. But each one has to be removed individually, which takes yeah. takes a minute. Yeah. So you got to find place to put it all as you as you take it apart. Right. And I didn't get a lot of, lot of table space because I always come in late. So. all the different modules out there. Yep, and the turrets actually move. So if you look at the turrets, you can just turn an engine and they turn like that. There are gears inside. Um, so then these flip up here and you can remove the rest of the uh, top panels. Expose some more of the bottom floors here. Yep, so we're getting down towards level one. So I noticed you slid some pieces over there, so how does that work exactly then when you're attaching those panels? Um, it's just like a locking me mechanism to sort of keep the panels aligned. Okay. And now the uh, front panels slide off on big rails. So those are kind of attached to the railings here and that's kind of how it guides those on? Uh, yeah. And um, it can carry two TIE fighters when they fold up. It has one landing craft. Um, on level one, you've got uh, barracks, um, a canteen, uh, there's a cargo bay area and a detention center over here. Um, in the center, you also have some engine rooms. Um, this is removable. There's like engineers down there. And um, the probe droids can actually be launched from the outside by pulling a greeble and it drops a probe droid out. <laughs> um, the landing craft, LEGO just came out with a landing craft set. Um, but this one has some unconventional wings to sort of enable it to 
fit inside the hangar. Uh, it snapped off. Well, yeah. There we go. There you go. Landing craft. <laughs> the way you were able to do the folding there to get it to, to fit in the small hangar bay. Yeah, I mean, it's a big hangar bay for a Lego ship, but it's still pretty small. So everything's got to fold up as much as possible. Um, I'll try to find a place to put this. And that's pretty much it for the Tyrant. Um, it weighs a lot. It's hard to transport. <laughs> so I'm not sure if I'll have it at another show after this one, but we'll see. It looks like it'd be hard to transport. So when you started on this project, how did you figure out all the different rooms, the modules and everything? Was there kind of plans you sketched out at all? Or did, you, did you just start building? Um, I just started building. I got like two Star Destroyer sets, and I tried to take them apart and make a really big Star Destroyer, and it just sort of evolved from there. Okay. So. Yeah. But uh, after that, I made the Constrictor, like a little escort ship. Um, and I actually sell instructions for this one. It's a little interdictor cruiser which has been on Star Wars Rebels. Mine doesn't look exactly like the Rebels version, but it's pretty similar. And it also has an interior, which is much, also a carry handle. Whoops. Hit the Tyrant there. But it just folds open. So like, much easier than the Tyrant to get okay. into the interior. Yeah, so you can get to the details a lot easier, but it's still packed with all the different panels and minifigs. Yep. I like interiors, so all my builds feature interiors. Um, it's a big part of it. And that's a nice carry handle, so moving that one is very easy. You just pick it up. Yeah. And you said you sell instructions for this. Where can people find those if they're interested in getting those? Um, if they went to my YouTube channel, uh, Doom Handle, they would see links to Rebrickable. Also, if you search on Rebrickable for um, either the aggressor or the constrictor, they're pretty easy to find. Okay. We'll make sure to put a link in the description of the video then, so if anybody wants to check those out, you can definitely find those. And the third gray triangle ship is the Aggressor. So this one I designed after the Tyrant. A lot of people ask for instructions for the Tyrant. It's just way too big. <laughs> I mean, it, people wouldn't even be able to move it if they built it. Like, I'd have to really explain, like, how to do everything. It'd be, it's just not it's feasible. It's not a practical design for instructions. Right. So the Aggressor was built originally in a regular Star Destroyer configuration. Um, so I could sell instructions for the regular Star Destroyer configuration. I've since modified it to a Victory class just to be a little bit different. It's also smaller than the Tyrant. Um, but it has a lot of improvements in terms of how it comes apart. Like instead of the axles and stuff, the bridge just slides off on a rail. It still has uh, three levels. They're just more cramped. It still has a conf conference room up there. And uh, the main bridge has some interior space in it, but it wasn't big enough for a typical Imperial bridge, so I put that on level two, which is also removable. And there's like engine stuff under there. It also has movable turrets, like the uh, Tyrant. Um, but I might have broken them because I switched it to a three turret configuration. The regular, the instructions version has four turrets, and they used to work pretty reliably, but we'll see. I did something wrong. And the uh, top panels, the improved system, they just have like little Technic hooks. You can just drop them into place. It only takes a couple seconds to remove them. You can definitely tell how you've improved and your technique has gotten better as you've done these. Yeah, way easier to remove them. And with the, uh, the instructions version of the ship, the regular ISD configuration, you can actually remove the front panels without removing the back part of the ship. So you can just take off the front panels, and like if you want to reload the TIE Fighters or the probe droids, you can do that without even removing the bridge if you want to. So it still has a canteen. I tried to include my favorite rooms, which were the canteen and the barracks. Um, there's a couple control stations on the ground floor as well. Um, the TIE Fighters are redesigned. They're, uh, Cockpit's a lot sturdier than the Tyrant's TIE Fighters. And they also have folding wings. So they're just regular TIE Fighters, but again, they had to fold up. Yeah. And uh, I had to put these rails here to make use of this space. Um, I couldn't just have a big hangar bay or there won't be any interior space left. And you can deploy them 
from the hangar bay if you want to. The rail actually retracts, and you can control the rail using this control here. You got all that playability in there. Yeah, I like play features too. So I'm one of the, the few people that likes interiors and play features <laughs> and all that kind of stuff. Um, the probe droid launcher, they're not in there, but they would go right there and you push a button, launch or something like that. And uh, that's about it for the aggressor. <laughs> yeah. These are some of the modifications. The regular version doesn't have these missile turrets. That's to make it a victory class. And the ringlets are the typical victory class features. Um, so that was a recent modification. This is, a, this is an incredible fleet you've got here. Do you have plans to expand on this at all and add, add more spaceships? Um, not at the moment. I mean, I'm always looking for stuff to do. Uh, I'm working on a Mon Calamari cruiser, but I haven't made a whole lot of progress at this point. Okay. Do you feel like when you add all this, this detailed interior, do you have to sacrifice kind of structure and the, the outside of the ship at all, or can you find a good balance there still? Um, I tend not to sacrifice structure. I like a very robust structure, um, probably too much. Like That's why the part count, even for the small one, is 15,000, because I use a lot of pieces, a lot of small pieces. You've got Technic. Since there's no support going down the center of either the tyrant or the aggressor, you have to support through the walls of the ship, so there are like truss type structures along the sides to keep it uh, supported. Um, just a lot of technic support. So I mean, this one's very strong. It's pretty inflexible. You can, how it's configured right now, you can move it like this just by picking up the stands. Okay. You could move it when it's all together, but I wouldn't recommend it. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> Something bad could happen. Yep. Yeah. Well, these are amazing. Thanks so much for taking the time to, to show us through all the interiors and everything. I think it's, it's amazing builds you brought here, so I really appreciate it.
Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. My name's Doug Davis, and this is our Battle of Geonosis, the Droid Factory. Uh, we started about 2011. Uh, we didn't have a lot of time for the first show. We had about three weeks, so a lot of the things that we did are cardboard boxes underneath tablecloths, and then we put sets on the top and some custom things. And five years later, we now have 140 base plates, 2,000 minifigures, a gigantic uh, eight foot tall mountain that's five foot wide, five feet deep, that's all uh, me mechanized inside. And uh, we set the battlefield up different every time we come. We like to change things up. This time we put the droids and the clones basically one battle plate away from uh, everything breaking loose. <laughs> There you go. So is it almost like a modular system with the base plates so you can set it at the battlefield up separately each time? Yes. Actually, okay. every everything out here is 100% changeable, okay. and we do change it every time. Sometimes the clones win, sometimes the droids win. <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the mood. Yeah, this is so impressive. How long does it usually take to set this whole thing up at a show? Well, with uh, two people in Nashville a few months ago that have never even seen Star Wars movies before, uh, I was able to talk to them, and we put this together in less than four hours. Okay. So, you know, for six eight-foot tables side by side, I was pretty happy with that. <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when my Star Wars geek buddies that uh, helped me at the show, because this has kind of been my backyard, uh, there was six of us, and we had it knocked out in about two and a half hours. So, mm -hmm. it uh, it does help when you've got a little movie knowledge and 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 know which well which cannon's supposed to be facing which direction, you know? <laughs> there you go. Have an idea of kind of the storyline of what's going on here. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Having seen the movie helps out, or if I had some still pictures, maybe that would have helped out too. But I wasn't quite as prepared. I didn't think I had to be in Nashville. But uh, we, we got through it, and we, we did a good job. People liked it. So I love to see the crowd when they walk up on this side. and They go, oh, wow, cool, that's a battlefield. And then they walk to the backside where the mountain is and all the stuff's moving, and they're like, holy cow! <laughs> Yeah, well, that's, we can walk to the back now then if you don't mind and kind of take a look inside the mountain and get a closer look at the, the whole mountain here because this thing is, is just massive. So much, so much cool stuff. So kind of what's going on back here? Well, when everything works, right now I've got one wire that's shorted <laughs> out this morning. Normally on the left side here, this uh, conveyor belt takes raw plastic up to the foundry that's in the back. From the foundry it comes out and it splits into two different lines. One's a super battle droid factory line and the other one's a regular battle droid line. The battle droids get hammered, stamped, and uh, cut and saw and everything that, that happens in the movie and just follows it down. And when they get down to the bottom, they line up in formation so they can go join the fight. Okay. Well, what's, what's kind of the gears and what's the keep, keeping everything running in there? Everything in here is ran. There's two NXT motors and, um, I'm sorry, two NXT brains. And there's one, two, three, four. There's about nine different motors that run into uh, just different gear systems. We kind of slow it down as it gets down to the bottom. Uh, speed it up and we get to the top. We've got a couple of rechargeable 9 volt battery packs that we just switched to. And normally this piece on the top, uh, Anakin Skywalker chases this droid ship during the whole show. Uh, however, our NXT for that, we left it home. So, <laughs> <laughs> so they're just stationary there for now. So some, some of that built into the mountain here then? Some of that like wiring is there like the, that stuff? Well, a lot of the wiring, um, I can show you an access panel over here on the side. Uh, people are going to go, what, what is that guy building with? But it's actually got a base inside of Duplo bricks. Okay. So we've got a little work center there that we hide our NXTs and our extra batteries and sometimes extra motors and clips and things like that. Um, that way it keeps out of sight and still looks cool. We used to put this part together every time we set a show up and we realized, you know, we could put this on a wooden platform and take it in three pieces instead of 30. It'd probably make our lives a lot easier. So now I just have to have two gigantic guys that work out for, you know, three or four days a week to help me carry it in. But uh, we, we got smart. We got a cart now, so it does help it a little bit, too. Yeah. Was, was doing the landscaping kind of on the mountain, is that difficult, kind of building that up, getting the rugged look all right? No, I think that's probably the easiest part on the, on the outside. Uh, I think the toughest part we had, because we don't use digital designer, we build it the old-fashioned way with a bunch of guys and an occasional cuss word or two that comes out because we forgot to do something. But... Uh, every once in a while, we put you know things that stick out on the inside so we can build off those points. And sometimes when we redo it, because this is the seventh version of Geonosis, hey, we, we forgot, you know, or we wanted to put a conveyor belt across this way, and we realized, man, there's nothing to attach it to. Start over. <laughs> 
So we start over, we put in you know, some more things that we can hook into the walls and make it a little more sturdy. And a lot of times we find cool parts, you know, in other collections, things that we buy and assimilate into. Uh, we have a shop here on the south side of Indy and, and a lot of things come in the door. And we think, oh my God, this would be great for Geonosis. So we figure out a way to put it in next year. So yeah, that works really well. And then be bigger, better, better next year. <laughs> Very cool. So you continue to upgrade it. So do you have some of the older Star Wars sets or is most of this kind of the, the newer sets? Because I know Star Wars has been around for like over 15 years now. Um, actually, the big MTT transports for the droids, those are the original ones. I okay. think they're about 2007 vintage year. And I think we have four original gunships and then we have six new gunships that we um, we wanted to make the look a little bit different on those. Uh, we like the gunships that were the originals because we make them bigger inside so it holds more troops so that it looks like it's carrying more clones into the battlefield. So, and we like to put different decals, and you know, we had some medical decals made, so we've got one ship that doesn't have as much armament that's supposed to go get the clones that get hurt and take them back to the, to the mobile uh, medical center. So, yeah. but yeah, there's, there's a lot of, there's a mixture of old and new in here. Okay. Yeah, this whole thing is really impressive. Is it hard to keep all the, the moving parts here in the mountain running, or is, is that difficult to make sure that stuff doesn't break down at a show? Well, it, it normally doesn't have any problems at all. And I know the wire that went bad this morning has probably been in service on this for about four years. And it, of course, it's the wire that's snaked all through the bottom of the stuff that's built. So it's not an easy quick fix. And I didn't want to do it during the show because you know, you'd see a grown man up there, probably the bad side of him, you know, been over replacing a wire for a while. It'd probably take me a half hour, 45 minutes to do it. So. Yeah, there you go. But for the most part, it seems to run well done. That's good. It does. And actually, uh, we redid some of the conveyor belts about two months ago. We used to run through uh, rechargeable AA batteries. We would burn through about a dozen of those in two to three hours at a show. And we've upgraded some of the gearing. We replaced some of the rods and the Technique pins and things in there. And uh, last time in Nashville, it ran for eight straight hours on a single battery change. So we're real happy with that. <laughs> Because that's, again, one of those things, you know, if you can put it up and walk away, it's a whole lot easier because we can enjoy the show and go look at all the cool stuff, too. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, that's great. This, this whole display is so impressive, especially the mountain part with all the moving parts here. I think this is really great. So thank you for talking with me about it. Appreciate Thanks it. Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, get him, the bad guy! I killed the clown! And we're good. Oh, I'm Jingle Fett. I'm Boba Fett's dad. I'm Count Duco. Give me the plans for the Death Star. I'm Viceroy. I work for some economic trade federation. This whole movie is about economics. That's that's about it. What sound does the droid make? Oh, uh, Roger, Roger. <laughs> what do you think of the uh, minifig on a base plate technique used by this designer? Oh, it's ingenious. There's just, it's all about minifigs on a base plate. You know, you, you know, you got, you got to have a big base plate and just like a few figs. It's all about the figs. I don't care about the sets or the mocks. It's all about the figs. Large collections of figs are pretty incredible. I say that if you own a large quantity of clones on a base plate, you're number one in my book. Well, I think that wraps this up for us. Thank you, Shiloh. I appreciate it. One, two, three. Hey, guys, it's Rich Boy Jay. And Garrett Bricks. And today we're showing you our crate mod. We've been working on this thing for about six months now. We started in January and we have been building it for this convention here at Brick Fiesta in San Antonio. And this is the culmination of many long nights of hard work, many brick link orders, many pick a brick orders, many runs across the city to go to a Lego store and um, a lot of very fun build streams on the YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can start over here in this area. You guys have seen the ATM6, and that was um, probably the biggest, my biggest contribution to this. Obviously, it's a 16,000 piece build. There are many of these in the actual scene from the movie. Um, I thought one of them should be sufficient. And it, most people feel that same way as well. It's quite a large build, but if we move back around here, 
we're going to actually show you guys the custom Kylo Ren command shuttle that Garrett did. Do you want to detail that a little bit? Yeah, so it's a uh, minifig scale, or as, at least as close as you can really get with minifigures. Uh, I've been working on this, trying to get the design down for a few months. I was really wanted to have the wings able to be, uh, be angled like that, like it is in the movie. They're very heavy, and uh, they, it, it works for what it, it needs to be. I wanted to get that, the skinny wings, but still be strong enough. Like There's Technic running through all of them to keep it kind of as flat as possible, while keeping it skinny and having that, that, that really sleek profile that the ship has. Do you yeah. want to show the uh, cockpit? Yeah, so you can uh, take the front off here, and you got uh, some pilots and stuff in there. Kylo Ren's there with uh, Hux. He's about to throw him against the wall <laughs> and uh, throw a fit of rage when the when the Millennium Falcon flies by. There you go, yeah. And so one thing I notice here is uh, you've got a lot of exposed studs, which I feel like in recent years, you know, is not as common in Lego building. So was that on purpose, or did you just not want to invest in all the tiles that you'd have to cover so up with? It, 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 Part of it was budgetary. I, there's a lot more tiles on the outside, and that's because the, the outside of the wings are going to be most what's displayed. Today, since the wings are spread out, the, the inside of the wings is a lot more exposed than it, it will be. Ideally, I would love to have it all tiled up. Kylo's shuttle is, thankfully, uh, if you look at the design of it, it's kind of splotchy in a ways. It looks like there's a bunch of, like, kind of alternating squares and stuff. It's not, like, completely smooth, so it works. Um, it's not ideal. I would have loved to have tiled up the whole thing, but the, the outside of the wings, which is the main thing, is... Uh, is where all, most of the tile, well, most of my tile money went. And then you've got it held up with some nice pick a brick cups there, so that works well. This is purist. These are Lego <laughs> products. This was actually, it was a last minute thing. We had no idea how we were going to, we wanted it to obviously be suspended somehow because it's flying in the movie. On day two, we'll have it landed. But so for today, we were thinking, originally we might, we were going to try to support it through the middle, support the body up. The wings are just way too heavy for that. If you try to lift it up by the body, the wings just kind of fall down. That's why the cups are supporting the wings. The body is really what's being held up. Okay. But it was really a last minute thing. We, it was like two days ago, maybe. We put the cups down, set it down. We were like, hey. It holds up. They're clear. They kind of blend with the white. I think it, it, the look of it, I think it works. Right, yeah. It's all very familiar. And speaking of tiles, this is the first order ATAT. So if you guys remember the Scarif mock that Garrett and I did, this was an ATACT. We have converted it to the ATAT version for the first order. So there are a few minor things that got switched up. And honestly, um, I'm hoping this is not a continuing trend because I'm tired of building new walkers. Um, it's, I'm hoping especially that the ATM6 shows up in another movie so I get at least a little bit more mileage out of it than just this. But if it doesn't, I won't be too mad. This is a great mock, I hope. And and hope you guys will enjoy it as well. Yeah. So one of the first things we actually started on with this mock is the salt pattern. And that was something that I think that was distinctly crate. Like you don't see that too often in Star Wars movies. So it was very pivotal that we got that correct. So we went through a bunch of different ideas for techniques. I think the first one we kind of had our eye on was the snot technique using kind of like um, plates and uh, curved slopes on the side to kind of create cracks. But upon closer inspection, we realized that the, um, the ground, it's not actually cracks in the ground, they aren't crevices. Instead, they're actually like salt clusters, so they should be protruding from the ground, which kind of influenced our decision to decide to go with like the stud to create somewhat of a honeycomb pattern, actually, to get um, the aesthetic of crate. And it actually turned out pretty well. It was something that we kind of jumped into. We like ordered a lot of the parts that we needed for it, hoping that it would look good, and it actually ended up, ended up turning out pretty well. So we were happy about that. Um, Doing it that way too helped us because we were able to do like the footprints and the trails and stuff. Otherwise, we wouldn't have been able to include those. So okay. having like the the big red exposed, doing it the way we did was a lot easier to have those kind of uh, have those in the mock in various places. Exactly. Yeah. And one of the things I did want to highlight at this point, having been working on it for so long, it's something we take for granted. But we used a lot of red slopes on the edges of the mock to kind of create a border around it. And the idea was to kind of have it be a cutout, like a cross section of the ground on crate. Obviously, it's a solid planet um, and below it is kind of a red dirt and that's what we used to, to kind of recreate that kind of aesthetic and just make it look a little bit better around the edges didn't want to just have it be flat bricks or anything like that and I think that it adds so much to the mock it's almost like a border that goes around it and it just it draws your attention automatically to it so it's something we spent a lot of time on and I think seeing it all finally together it was well worth investing in a bunch of slopes that we otherwise wouldn't have really needed to put into the mock it's like a big slice of cake you know it's like it's like sliced right out of the planet you know you got the nice like velvety kind of kind of border around it it's great <laughs> there you go. 
that's a good Absolutely. way to describe it. Um, so one thing we didn't want to show you guys is over here, we have the footprints with the troops marching in. And this is something that I feel everyone notices and it pops out because obviously, you know, it's little cute footprints for Lego guys. So people really get a kick out of that. So that was really fun to do. And this was one of the first things we actually did on the mock. And like once we finished this up, we were so excited to kind of move forward because like I think I posted a picture on Reddit of just the foot, like the guys walking in the footprints and it's probably like the 12th most upvoted posts on the Lego Reddit page. So um, it's funny how that works out. Um, but yeah, it, it turned out pretty well, I think. And um, the crate just lends itself so well to Lego. The contrast between the red and white with the footprints or the blast mm -hmm. or the crevices, like it, it all just works so well together. So I'm happy about that. It's so true, yeah. So then we'll move around to this side and see what else we can we can take a look at here. Yeah, so. Well, kind of, we when we were building this, we went from the back here and then built all the way to the front. So the cave was the last thing we did. So footprints was obviously the first thing we worked on. The second thing was the crash tie fighter, and so it was our first time really doing something different other than just doing the same uh, salt pattern over and yeah. over again. So I don't know if uh, from the trailer for anyone who remembers the trailer for the Last Jedi, there was a scene in it where a tie fighter crashes into the ground. It like hits and the wings break off and it like rolls around. Um, obviously, we started building. We started planning this even before the movie came out, and by the time we were starting working on it, even up to this point, the movie wasn't out on DVD yet. So we were watching like the trailers and stuff, just over and over and over again, trying to find little details of crate. There, were, there really wasn't a whole lot of like promotional footage for crate out there. It was more like a lot of drawn out shots and stuff. But one of those shots was the Tie Fighter crashing and two of the speeders kind of going around it that way. So we're like, we'll definitely include that. And I just love the way, I mean, we wanted for sure, because it's obviously a battle going on, so we have various battle damage stuff, and that's obviously the biggest one of that. So the ties kind of has like an impact crater where it landed and kind of and then rolled the wings all lift uh, debris behind and stuff and then the the tie pilots obviously uh, are safe and unharmed and they're about to call AAA to have someone come uh, come help them out there i love the wing planted into the the surface like that that's really neat as well yeah it because we needed some way for it to kind of be propped up so it wasn't just a bunch of flat pieces kind of behind it and it, i think you know it's it, it adds to it it's very clearly a crash the wings just kind of jutted there and maybe rolled a bit or just like stabbed into the dirt one more thing I did want to add is that everything in LEGO is always kind of built at 90 degrees one way or another. And I feel it makes the world of difference having that wing at a slight angle because people see it and it's unconventional. It looks different for LEGO. And I, that was one of the things I really wanted to do when I was building that, you know, add a little differentiation to it from just the typical like building techniques, techniques that people would use with LEGO. Um, so the next thing we can kind of highlight were the um, the ski speeders and the dust clouds that they kick up. So one of the most important things for us to do was to recreate the dust clouds that these ski speeders kick up. And this was something that we were totally dreading because dust isn't really an obvious thing to recreate in Lego. Like you'd have to think about it to be like, like what does this actually look like? Um, and we went with a bunch of curved slopes and you can see it kind of bubbles up towards the back. And it's kind of cartoony, but I feel it's sometimes that's necessary in Lego to give a more obvious representation of what you want to build and like when people see this like they automatically know like oh that's the dust cloud so it worked out pretty well in our favor and I think you know it, it really pops and um, it just adds to the kind of the flavor of crate with um, having more like big red type of contrast with the salt flats so I like the way that those came out. Yeah, and the lines in the, the salt there as well just works really well. Like you, like you mentioned earlier with Lego, I think it lends itself really nicely to creating those patterns. Right, yeah. You, you would honestly be surprised with how many people have asked us if we like took a knife and like cut tiles to get those shapes. But no, those are all Lego pieces. And we like creatively use the different uh, degrees of the wedge plates to create round curves that lend themselves to natural looking lines that will be formed by these ski speeders flying all across it. So we wanted to leave a nice like open area to have these lines because because once the battle is over and done with, like that's so that's one of the most identifying factors of crate, all those lines being left in the ground. So that was one of the most important things for us to design it to make sure we got that right. Mm -hmm. We also had to plan, and we, we drew that out, actually, because each every section is independent, and obviously the lines were going to cross multiple sections, so we actually drew out, and that was kind of a pain, making sure everything was lining up correctly, like putting the base plates next to each other when we were building, making right. sure nothing was, you know, making sure it would all line up, and the logic of it would kind of make sense. Right, yeah. And then the other thing was also just making sure, like, even in the contained canon of the mock, that everything kind of flowed well. So you'll notice all the lines start somewhere and end somewhere, and there's a ski speeder that kind of created it. They aren't just random, but they were actually thought through, and we made sure that, like, every ski speeder started at some place. So this one starts here, 
that this one actually started on that side and curves around. That one crashed over there, started right here, and then that one over there started right over here. So everything kind of makes sense in the in terms of the mock, and it's something that really wouldn't mean anything to the normal person, but for us, it makes sense and it's correct, and that's what we try to do with anything that we build. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, it works really well then. So if we keep making our way down here, I think we hit the trench scene. Yes. Um, the trenches were something that we both were just so excited to work on. Um, it's honestly influenced the entire mock being elevated. Um, so we, because of that, we wanted to make sure that it wasn't done for nothing. We wanted to make sure the trenches look good since it like cost us so much more money in bricks to have the whole thing elevated. And um, there's so many different details we put in. Namely, if you look like in the ground, there's like the, the great sections and there's the... Um, uh, dark gray curved tiles in there and it's something that's kind of trivial but like having them all together makes it look distinctly like the grates in the ground and then there's just all types of pipes and tubing and things like that that go throughout the entire trench and all together it creates a very awesome aesthetic and anyone who's seen The Last Jedi will see this and immediately know exactly like what's going on in this scene so that was a lot of fun and then I think Garrett did an excellent job lining up all the figures you can kind of take them through the scenes in that. Yeah, so I'm obviously on Crate they had the big trench and everyone was lined up, guns out, ready to get blasted by the First Order. Um, we we made a we we took like some care and we didn't want just the same minifigures placed over and over again. So we definitely we switched around faces. We tried to put as many unique hair and face combos as possible. We even recreated a lot of people. Uh, a lot of when our, for our live streams, we have all of our moderators. We recreated sig figs for them and threw them in the mock. And some of our friends, like myself and Jalen, are actually right here. Well, that's awesome. So you included your own figures. Yeah, that's really we got cool. a promotion from the Lego store. There's a there's a, there's a ton of the, we have a, a, a ton of cameos and other figures of people from from the actual movie itself and other Lego YouTubers and like I said, our, moder our moderator team is there. Uh, probably the most recognizable scene with the figures is going to be the General Emmett standing up there with the binoculars. He kind of everyone was kind of hiding behind the trenches and he just stood up and looked out. I always got the I always got the impression that he was a veteran of the Battle of Hoth. He was like, it's just a bunch of big walkers, like we've seen this before. And so he steps out, there's some footprints behind him and then a little behind him is the guy that picked up the salt and tasted it and okay. said, oh, this is salt. It's not snow, guys, it's salt. And then right next to him was Gareth Edwards, the director of Rogue One. That was his cameo in the movie. So we were like, okay, well, he'll be in the mock too, right there where he is in the movie. So then the next part of this were the turrets and these were honestly, pretty difficult to build because there aren't any great shots of them in the movie. What I actually ended up having to do was play Star Wars Battlefront and like run around to like all sides of this to like <laughs> take pictures on my phone of the screen. And let me, I'm going to take you on a little story. So EA, if you're listening right now, please make Crate a map that you don't have to play on multiplayer to access the outside. I cannot tell you the amount of times I was running around, minding my own business, just trying to take pictures, and people were trying to kill me. <laughs> how, is, how am I supposed to make LEGO Star Wars mocks when people online want to kill me? So It's hard to get the source material when you're being shot at. Exactly, yeah. Like honest, Honestly, I went through some things, man. It, it was not a good time. But I made it through, I persevered, and I converged on a pretty good looking t uh, turret design, I think. No thanks to you, Star Wars Battlefront players. But anyways, um, these things were actually pretty cool. I thought that like the design, it just pops. It's like not dark gray, it's not white, it's not red. They really pop out because they're such different colors, especially with the orange stripes that go around it. And it was actually designed to be modular, so the entire thing comes apart. Um, Father Time wasn't feeling us though, so we didn't really have the opportunity to finish it all up. But you can actually see that there is space to have an interior if we decided to do that. And of course, there's different minifigures and such lining up throughout the turrets, um, just helping out, doing their part in the large battle. So, uh, well. Now, with these minifigures here, uh, or any you know, kind of the build in general, do you guys use any third-party elements that kind of add little details to the minifigs and details of the build, or is this all just normal Lego pieces? This is all normal Lego. Okay. This is all purist. We pride ourselves on that. Um, I think if we really wanted, we could invest in custom weapons, but there's just so many figures that it would become more pricey than it's worth, in my opinion. We, we have a ton of just Lego blasters in general because we're big Lego Star Wars collectors, so it's just something that we have there ready to go. And I think the blasters are pretty, I mean, like all the all the resistance figures have the like the more like the gunmetal gray ones because that's what they come with in the Lego sets and the stormtroopers have the plain black ones which is more. So that's that's accurate enough for us I think that's it gives the idea across of what the guns are supposed to be. Um, so next we have we'll the do, mountains. Uh, the, we'll show off oh, the yeah. tunnels real quick. One last thing with the with the trenches yeah. here. We can actually uh, pop up some of these sections here. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so you've got insides there. 
Yeah, so these will come up. There's also this one over here. I'll try to, this one. So we have these on both sides, actually. It's uh, pretty much the same. If you imagine, just mirror it on the other side. But we kind of wanted logic to flow with the, the trenches here. So you can imagine them running from the base through the trenches and then out here to get to the, to the trench to get ready to, to die, basically, get blasted, no. <laughs> get blasted by a bunch of ATM-6s. They re the resistance didn't last very long. They tried, but they didn't last very long. No, that's such a great element of the build, that extra detail. Obviously, I mean, because the trenches would be underneath there, so it makes sense. Exactly. But actually building that in is so cool. We had a lot of fun doing that. I mean, like we, ever, since, we, ever since we started, we knew the trenches were going to be our most thing. We were, it was really the thing we were looking forward to most, being able to design the trenches and kind of have that, like, have that logic flowing with it. Like, OK, so where are they going to enter in? Where is the tunnels going to be? Where are they going to come from from the base? and it was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. yeah, so next we can actually go ahead and look at the rock work. This was something that we spent a lot of time on. Um, we both basically picked one side of the rocks and we just built them up ourselves to try to get them to a certain height. We used um, a big combination of like the dark gray, big slopes, the white ones in that same color, the red ones as well, just kind of having like the, the dirt color popping through. And I think they all kind of culminate to create a pretty good representation of what you see on Crate. It's not one obvious color, it's a really combination of all of them. So we tried to make that as natural as possible with Lego. And then the other thing is obviously the big door that keeps the bad guys out. And you can see that we wanted to recreate its kind of rusted color. That's why we chose dark tan. And I think that worked pretty well. And one of the things that was like kind of something we took for granted when we started designing it, but we really realized it was important to do was actually have the angle right here bevel at the bottom and there are no reverse slopes in that color nor that size that specific angle so we had to take the regular slopes fix, um, flip them upside down and then try to like connect them and have it work seamlessly so it's it's pretty complicated but I think it worked out pretty well so one thing we'll show you before we go into the inside is back on the other side come around and check this side out so there's this big hatch. In the movie, the ski speeders actually come out of the hatch, and that's how they make it to the battlefield. So if you'll notice, the lines that start right here, it's from the ski speeders that flew out from the door. And you can see we actually have a cameo from one of the biggest stars in Hollywood right now, Vin Diesel from Fast and the Furious, also known as Dominic Toretto. He's hijacking the ski speeder, and he's doing one of his many crazy stunts. So um, we wanted to show some appreciation to um, a globally renowned film franchise. And I think that we faithfully, we did it justice. So I'm happy about that. There you go. I think you guys did well. So we come around here. I mean, you've got some kind of like Easter eggs hidden in the side then? Yes. So um, I'll start around this side. This is the one that I kind of built up. Okay. Um, you can see that I got a scene from everyone's favorite Star Wars movie, Attack of the Clones. When they go through the droid factory, you got the Geonosian popping out of the wall, about to attack them. So that was pretty cool. That's to the do. height of filmmaking right there. It really is. Honestly, that movie might just be as good as Fast and Furious. But if we move down here to the command room, um, this is one of the funnest parts of the mock, just because we spend so much time in here in the movie, got the lights as well. If you'll pan out for a second, there's actually an access door that we um, put in there to actually just access the lights and turn them on and off, so don't have to tear the mock apart to do that. Mm -hmm. um, pretty cool idea, I thought. Shout out to Brick Plumber for that. But this was so fun to do. There's Leia back there, obviously sitting on her chair, giving out orders and some other... Um, important characters from the movie and there was no like one shot of this room that made it really convenient to make this so I had to do some guesswork and get a lot of different angles from the movie to make this again possible and if you actually look to the left in that cave right there you will see a familiar face Mr. Luke Skywalker coming through and trying to save the day so it's um, something that you wouldn't really notice unless you looked hard, but the payoff is really good because it's like, oh, Luke Skywalker. What? Everyone wants to see him. <laughs> so we'll um, take you around to the other side, then we'll come back into here. Okay. This is more of the same kind of layout from that side. It's the side of the mountain here kind of cut out. There's a few rooms here. We got a uh, Minecraft room here. It, you know, we were doing these little hidden caves, and the first thing I thought of when I thought of caves and what kind of Easter eggs to include was Minecraft, yeah. and Le uh, Lego makes Minecraft sets, so worked out really well. We got a, this room down here. This is kind of a, the, this would be like a uh, kind of locked off closed room. We decided to put a lot of Easter eggs and references. We call this the fan appreciation room. This was, uh, there's a lot of just in jokes and stuff referencing uh, a lot of people that watch our live stream. So that was kind of, we put that there for, to, uh, for their appreciation. A lot of in jokes that no one else, I won't go into explaining any of them because no one will find them funny. I will say shout out to Drink Tea. 
That's what that is. Over here we have another room, uh, this is with a little Darth Maul cameo. I've noticed that Darth Maul makes a lot of cameos in Star Wars mocks. He also makes a lot of cameos in Star Wars movies and Star Wars TV shows, maybe where he might not necessarily belong. So there he is, he's running his criminal enterprise from a, from a dank cave. He's on just like Earth. brooding in the cave. He is, I mean, he's Darth Maul, he's frustrated that he got cut in half, it's been years, and he's still around. He's, he's like, Disney just kill me off already. Just, just be done with me. <laughs> There's a room here, uh, just a little uh, one of the crystal foxes. Jalen did an awesome job whipping up those foxes. Uh, the uh, vault, vault Texas. Yeah, I know what they're called. There's a ton of them all throughout the mock. Uh, we, how many? Maybe 25 of them. They're, and they're all around. And then there's one last little tunnel here. It kind of you can kind of look through it, and it leads out into the main cave area. So one more thing I didn't want to show you guys. It's back over this way recreated one of the rooms from the crystal caves you can see that got some light bricks in there illuminating it got a miner who i guess got forgotten about rest in peace um, and a lot of those crystals just kind of protruding from the ground and that was actually a lot of fun to make just because that um i didn't really have to think too hard about it it was all natural so i can just you know build up whatever i wanted and um, anyone who plays a battlefront game would certainly know exactly what that is and get some appreciation out of that so that was a fun little room to whip up Mm -hmm. So now moving to the Grand Cave area, this is where it all goes down. First thing we'll highlight is the First Order shuttle that comes in. This is the one that Finn and Rose stole from the Supremacy. They pull in, well they don't really pull in, they crash in, and they're like telling people don't shoot, don't shoot, and then everyone down here is shooting at them. <laughs> you can see Leia even has her gun, and then here's Poe reuniting with his best friend. And um, this was so fun to do just because like, it, we got to recreate this whole little part of the movie and anyone who remembers it will know exactly what this is. And the other nice part was that this ship ends up like landing destroyed so I didn't have to build all of it. And I, it'd be nice if that happened more often. Um, <laughs> And also, we have the resistance shuttle that I designed over here. They take um, a few of these off of their ship in order to get onto this planet, so I thought that I'd put one of those in there as well. And if you'll look over there in that corner, that's actually a reference to the LEGO Star Wars video game. So anyone who remembers those knows that there's like buttons on the ground that you can use to access special rooms, so we thought that our fan appreciation room deserved um, some sort of, I don't know, like challenge to be able to get in. So that's what's going on over there. We got the third guy running up, about to step on his button, so they can get into there. Yeah, those frustrating buttons you always had to like move characters and everything and like position everyone exactly right. So yep, exactly. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. So then um, up top we have the hangar section and this isn't actually something you see in the movie, but it's something we thought that made the most sense since we knew we were gonna have that ski speeder flying out of the door. It just made sense that you know there would be some sort of hangar for them to kind of get from inside of the base to the outside. So you can see there's the rebel logos on the ground because this is obviously an abandoned rebel base and we tried to you know recreate some of the familiar things you'd see that the rebels had and then of course like there's the guy seeing off his buddy onto the battlefield mm -hmm. yeah and then you've even got some really impressive rock work on the inside here as well i'm sure after doing the the front mountain that wasn't difficult for you guys by that point yeah so that was the weird thing like we were i feel like before we got to any of this we were so excited because it's like it's like not salt anymore we get to like build stuff up and do rooms and then we started building rocks on the front and we were like, okay, it's so fun that we're done with that. And then we didn't realize we had even more rocks to build on the inside. So I think we're both done with rocks for quite some time. But I think it all ended up working pretty well. And, I mean, it really does a good job at recreating the entire aesthetic of the inside of the caves. So I think it was well worth it. And um, one of the other things that was actually kind of difficult to design was the door Obviously on the front, it's the dark gray slopes normally. On the back, it's kind of the same thing, but it's at a slant. So once again, there are no reverse slopes in dark gray, dark tan, I'm sorry. So I had to like flip those upside down and have those kind of all fit together and stay in there in order to recreate that look. So that was not easy at all, but it ended up working out pretty well. And I think that like if you go around the other side and you look here, you're like, oh, okay, like that looks like it all makes sense and fits together. So I like that a lot. Yeah, so that's incredible. That's the whole thing there. So uh, do you guys know how, how long this and then how wide the whole thing is? So it's four base plates by nine gray base plates. Um, I think 16, what, feet. 16 feet by five, 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 five. five feet. Okay. So definitely the biggest thing we've ever built uh, <laughs> by far. Um, it was, it's been about maybe six months of work or so, another month before that of planning it out. And it's, it's definitely been a journey. We're both very happy and relieved to be done. 
Um, this is the last time it'll be displayed. We will. A lot of the things on here will be changing for day two, so I'm sure you guys will love to come back yeah. and check those out, and we'll highlight those. So there's a few things that kind of change. Um, but yeah, it's been a journey. It's been fun, and, and I'm looking forward to hopefully outdoing this next year with with my uh, friend Jalen here. There you go. Yeah, great building duo here. As you guys work on this together, you, you both live in the same city. So were you in the same kind of physical spot building, or would you build different sections, then bring it all together? So we built all of this at his place. He had oh, yeah. the he had the space for it. It took up like half of a room. And we we live in the same city. I live about it's like a 35 minute drive, but I would still go up once or twice a week. We'd try to and work on it and just you know get it out, get it done. And it, obviously there was a lot of late nights, and I think it was all worth it in the end. And then you guys mentioned a few times that you did a lot of this during YouTube live streams. So talk about kind of how that works and, you know, how you interact with other builders as you're, as you're kind of going through the process. Right, yeah. So I don't think it can be understated the amount of people we've been able to meet through this journey, specifically because we did do the live streams on YouTube. And it was started off as just something for us to do other than watching Star Wars movies because we got through, like, the four or five good ones and we decided we didn't want to punish ourselves. So we decided, let's do something else. Let's go ahead, hop on the live streams, and we can, you know, talk to people and give ourselves something to do that would kind of help pass the time when we're building monotonous things. I think honestly, like having to kind of like pay attention to the chat, which is something we prided ourselves on. We didn't want to be just, you know, a video happening of people building. We wanted to engage with people, start mm -hmm. conversations, and build memories, like the stuff that we could put into that fan appreciation room. But um, it kind of, I would say, slowed the building process just because we kind of had to split our time. But it ultimately made it more enjoyable for both of us because we weren't just mindlessly stacking bricks. So it was a trade-off, but one I felt that was well worth it just because we got to not only meet so many people, but also create so many memories with people that we honestly they talk on like a daily basis to nowadays so it's pretty cool mm -hmm. that's great well then we'll come back tomorrow and see what you guys have changed up and what else you have to offer so thank you so much appreciate it awesome thanks guys okay so we're back for day two for the exciting conclusion of the crate build to see what uh our two talented builders here have added to the build and changed up uh, for day two so if you guys want to start back here in the cave and then we'll move our way forward and see what's changed all right actually i think we'll start on this side and then okay. we'll come right back around so the first thing I did want to show you guys is that we have probably the most heartwarming scene in The Last Jedi. We have Luke having his meeting with his sister Leia, handing her those gold dice, and um, seeing her for the last time uh, as, I guess, a physical like being. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Um, that was actually a really fun scene to replicate because I think that in the movie, like it's just a very beautiful scene, especially with the passing of Carrie Fisher. Um, I liked that we could kind of, you know, remove, remove everyone from this room, I guess, from, except for C-3PO, and then have those two having their moment. So I really do like that part of the mock and it holds a special place in my heart. It's, a, it's kind of like a tribute of this to Carrie Fisher. So I like that part of the mock. Uh, moving around to this side, we have the evacuation area. So obviously they're chasing the, well not really chasing the Voltexes, they're following the Voltexes to the outside of the mock. We got uh, a few of the main characters running after her, Poe's leading the way with BB-8, Leia of course is following behind. And then if you also check back here, it's kind of hard to see, but through there Kylo Ren is marching into the door with his snow troopers and they are looking for the resistance. There you go, yeah, some great then, added um, details. I actually did want to highlight this room. It's a little dark, but you can see that myself, Garrett, the Brick Wiz, and John Cena have all run up on Darth Maul. We got a few questions for him. We want to know why he's showing up in all of our movies. <laughs> Hopefully he has some answers for us. There you go. Very important scene there. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, so then moving back over to the battlefield. So the battle is now over. You kind of look at the trenches. There's a lot of people. We'll say they're sleeping, um, taking a nap after a really hard-fought battle. Uh, the first order hit them pretty hard. So there's some. It just wears you out. It, it's a battle's hard, especially when you're facing overwhelming odds. Uh, so there's a lot of wipeouts in the trench. Uh, we got some like some smoke kind of billowing up. Mainly the uh, doorway there has been blown out. The battering ram cannon, which. It's not on our mock, we'll just pretend it's kind of behind a ways. It shot a big hole through the door, cracked it like an egg, so there's some smoke billowing up. Uh, a lot of where our, our speeders were before, you know, just weren't there anymore, so the, it'll either the trail will keep going. So before it was right here and the trail stopped, the trail kept going, we switched those out, so it's like the, kind of the continuation, they, they went off. Uh, this speeder did not make it that far, she had a bit of an issue there. And then uh, you can also notice the, the, other, the same with the speeders on the other side, they're not there anymore. Uh, probably the biggest change for today was uh, the classic scene, Luke and Kylo facing off. This was something that everyone is always asking when we set up this display. They say, well, where's Luke and Kylo? Well, here they are. It's day two. The battle's over, so now they're facing off. You can see the, the shuttle has now landed. 
Kylo got out. There's some, uh, some red behind him where he's walking. Notice there's no red around Luke. Uh, there's something going on there. No spoilers, of course. But they're about to face off. That's probably one of the best scenes in the movie, I think. He tosses his cape off and they have a, a confrontation. And that's kind of, I guess, the climax of the movie. So we definitely wanted to replicate that. It's really nice having the white just kind of around them. And they're kind of right smack dab center in the, of the mock with the, the, the giant shuttle behind it, kind of framing it all really well. So now the shuttle is on the ground. So did you have to switch anything up with the way that's supported since it's not up on the, the pick a brick cups any longer? Yeah, so I have some landing gears on it. They're just... Uh, these here, there's, they don't like go up or anything. So basically, when we took it off of the cups and when they were flying, I removed the bricks that were kind of wedging the, the wings kind of in that angle. So just took those out, and then I just have to kind of hold the shuttle upside down, put the landing gears on, and then flip it back up and set it back down. It's all pretty sturdy, so you can kind of move it around to get those under there. But it's just a matter of sticking those little guys there, and it stands up on it. So if you come back to this side, you'll see we still have some troopers taking a nap, but namely there is Finn carrying Rose over back to the base. I'm sure people will have some opinions on that being in this mock. <laughs> and the other thing we wanted to highlight is that right on the front of the door, we actually had pop-out sections. So if you get up close, you can see that there's a hole that goes straight through the door to the inside of the base, and that's kind of what the First Order did to try to get into the base, and then that's where Luke makes his exit throughout the base to face down Kylo Ren. So that was one of the first things we decided we wanted wanted to do. We wanted to make sure that once we switched the stuff out, we were able to complete the entire scene and have it look the way it does in the movie. So I'm happy that that actually worked out pretty well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I love the extra effort you guys went to to, to update it for day two here. I, the whole thing is just incredible. So what's your plans for the, for the future with this build? You want to say, Jalen? <laughs> yeah, so after much deliberation, I think that we have gotten the most that we can possibly get out of this mock. And we probably are going to destroy it after this convention. We'll keep some of the bigger pieces like the walkers and the Kylo Ren command shuttle, but everything else we have no attachment to any longer and we're going to make it a lot easier to pack up. There you go. That should be fun to watch. <laughs> it served its purpose. It's time to go. One last thing, um, we wanted to give some special thanks to some very close friends who actually made it possible for us to get this here. We have our friend Mark and our friend Matt. These guys are BrickWiz and John Cena respectively on YouTube. Make sure you check them out. They gave us um, a lot of help with getting this thing together and it would not have been possible nor this easy without them. So shout out to those guys. There you go. You've always got the supporting team here. It always helps to have other people with you. When you have something this big, you really do. You need some help because, I mean, obviously when we were building it, we were planning on doing this eventually, and we never really thought, like, oh, we can handle it ourselves. And it wasn't until we actually had them with us and still barely kind of managing to get it here and managing to get it on time and finished in a working state. Really, it showed we did need some extra help there at the end. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Are you ready? Yeah. Are ready? Get that hold of the door as well. All right. One, two. Congratulations, boys. On to the next project. Cleanup time, very well. I mean, see, when we were we during, did it. during the interview, when we were talking about how easily it packs up, this is probably <laughs> yeah. on the uh, yeah. So um, yeah. We'll get to wherever we're putting so this. So, crate is gone. Well, uh, we'll be well most of the crate is gone. A couple weeks. <laughs> It's like it's grown up. You guys are just doing it. We just destroyed half It actually all fell in a nice little mess. I was really worried it was going to be like, what? It was a live one moment. Do what? I'll do that. How quickly it turns. At a moment. Really? It's a really efficient way to clean base plates. Really? Got a lot of it. Oh, yeah. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video.
My name is Jim Carpenter. This is the DS1 uh, Death Star. It took me about two years to build. As far as uh, piece count, price count, it's kind of it's kind of unknown at this point. Now more to follow on that. So we're gonna start here. So obviously this is like the the hollow projection room right here. This is the uh, officers' uh, cantina right here. This is like the the Death Star uh, control room uh, back there in the screen. You can see uh, Grand Moff Tarkin and Darth Vader getting ready to blow up Alderaan with uh, Princess Leia. Uh, this bay right here is where the uh, the Tie pilots uh, sleep. Uh, this is actually the briefing room for their briefing missions. This is the uh, the Tie the Tie bay right here. Obviously, these are there's a turbo shaft from Axis to get from here to the second level. Because back here, if you follow along, that's the control room back there for the uh, controls the the fly the uh, the Tie fighters. This is like a um, kind of like a hollow room. If you watch the, uh, the episodes with um, uh, the Star Wars Clone Wars, with the first couple episodes where the clone troopers go through their exercises, that's what that's modeled off of. This is the gym. So obviously they have like weights and uh, treadmills on the uh, right hand side, and of course the running track up above that. And then below here we have the speeder bike uh, maintenance and holding bay. And then below that this is the armory down here. And then right here, this is kind of just like a supply room. And then down here, this is just kind of like a like a bay in the uh, in the open there. All right, so I'll move over to this side. Obviously, this is a turbo laser uh, room right here. This is the officers' uh, um, uh, chow hall. Obviously, this is the the Death Star control room right here, still in progress uh, to be uh, to be finished. This is the main uh, main hangar bay. Uh, for the uh, for the Death Star, uh, below that obviously we have another uh, another turbo shaft or uh, turbo laser room. This is the uh, uh, the detention center. If you walk around here, so these little grates right here pu actually push in, and uh, this one on the left hand side when you push it in, you push the minute figure down, it'll fall down through into the trash compactor like in the actual movie. This is the uh, probe droid bay. This down here is the uh, the quarter or is the uh, the mess mess hall or chow hall for the enlisted soldiers. This down here is just another storage room, and then of course this is a storage bay uh, down here as well. All right. Obviously they have different hallways, you know, so the the uh, the troopers get access to uh, all the levels of the uh, the Death Star. So up here on this side, this is uh, Grand Moff Tarkin's uh, quarters. Below him, this is where the officers sleep. Obviously, this is the bay where Princess Leia and Luke Skywalker swing across, and then this kind of simulates the uh, where Chewbacca and the stormtrooper are waiting to go up the uh, the turbo shaft. And then below that, this is where Obi Wan is uh, with the tractor beam to uh, disable it. And then below that, we have a uh, the enlisted quarters uh, cantina. And then below that, we have like a droid maintenance room. All right, so I'll move over here to this section. All right, so this is the uh, the guns for the uh, for the Death Star. This uh, this side right here is uh, stormtroopers uh, quarters. These uh, actually slide out. They're actually their their beds that they can uh, they can get in and sleep in. Uh, if you come over here to this side, these are actually their their showers right here. This is kind of like their washing sinks, if you know what an industrial sink is. And then way in the back, they have uh, latrines back there, you know, where they... Um, of course, below that, more and more turbo shafts for the uh, station defense. Obviously, the, the turbo shafts get access to these two levels. And then below that, we have the, uh, the medical bay, which kind of takes up both sides, so I'll take you over here shortly. So obviously, here we have the, the Bakta tank bay, operating room. And then the the doctor's uh, the uh, the doctor's uh, office right there. Below that was just like a storage room. Then obviously you know the, the cantina which I uh, talked about uh, shortly. All right, so up here, just kind of have like an annex bay. Obviously more uh, more turbo shafts. This is uh, Darth Vader's uh, chamber. Obviously this is the other side of the stormtrooper bay um, where the stormtroopers uh, sleep. And then below that, this is for the scout troopers. That's where they uh, that's where they sleep at. And then below that, we have the second half of the uh, medical bay. So obviously we have like the like the the, uh, the entry table where they come in and check in. And obviously this is where they put like their uh, like their, uh, their their patients once they're done with their surgery. Below that, I have another turbo shaft. 
and then another storage room below that, and then just like a uh, another uh, annex bay down there where where the turbo shaft is. So this turbo shaft right here actually runs the whole length of the Death Star. All right, and then over here, this is like the turbo shaft bay. Um, so like say the one on the far side runs the whole length of the Death Star, and then the one closest to us runs from about right here all the way up to about right here, and then it stops. All right, and that's, uh, that's pretty much it. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Such So many details in there, that's amazing. So what was your design process on like that? Did you kind of just build from the bottom floor and up, or how did that work? Okay, so the, the biggest thing is I, I had to figure out uh, like how, how big I want to build it, and I pretty much came up with the general consensus that I want to be pretty much by 40 inches by 40 inches. So what I did is I built a mock shell using, so if you use, I kind of use like these Technic um, beams and plates to kind of like make a, a rounded shape, you know, to make it more uh, um, symmetrical. And so what I did is, is I built, I built the frame just using the outside. And once that was done, then I used the slope pieces, you know, the slope and then the inverted slope pieces to get close to that outside shell. And once that was done, then I went through, and as you can see right here, I outlined like how high each level was going to be and what I was going to put in each room. So I did that here, and then I went back through, and then of course I, I went through that, and then that kind of just outlined each each room that I wanted to uh, to design. You had notes and sort of drawings and stuff here yeah. to help you out along the way, yeah. but no, nothing like nothing in LDD or nothing like that. It was all pretty much freehand. A lot of rebuilding and building, you know. So which which was quite challenging at uh, at times. What was your inspiration for this? Just a Star Wars fan or just decided you wanted to go for a really big project? How did that work? So, so actually when this came about, I was actually, uh, I'm actually active duty military and uh, I was actually in Afghanistan and uh, I had my wife send me like two UCS Death Stars that I was going to put together. And I never quite finished it, you know, when I was there. So when I got home, I was like, well, I want to do something big. So let, let's do it, you know, let's do the Death Star. So that's, that was kind of like my, my inspiration from that. Um, what I did is in, uh, you know, this is my second brick fair. You know, in 2013, um, I actually brought the Star Destroyer that had the minifigure display. So I built that. So I just kind of, you know, kind of upgraded, upgraded from that. Right. Well, that's really impressive. That's interesting what you said about, you know, being active duty military and kind of Lego building, is that just to pass time or how does that work for you? Sure, I mean, it's, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of active duty members, you know, use Lego as, as kind of therapy, you know, just kind of on wine and stuff, yeah. um, you know, especially, you know, serving, you know, tours, you know, overseas and stuff. So it's just, it's kind of something that's just kind of, uh, kind of like a break, you know, just, just kind of step away, you know, from, you know, from the military aspect. Sure. Yeah, that makes sense. And then when you move this around, how does that work? Is it somewhat modular? Sure. So each level where you see, it actually separates, and basically how it transport is, you know, I built I built a crate, and each uh, most of these levels sit on a plywood uh, platform, and I just slide the platform into the crate, and it ships that fine. And you know, I came all the way from Clarksville, Tennessee, and uh, you know, traveled over 200 miles and traveled with no issues. So definitely, uh, definitely glad glad that initial test run went well, because the plan is is to hopefully bring it to uh, Star Wars Celebration in April. Well, that's awesome. Well, I thank you so much for telling me about this and taking me through the whole build. I think it turned out really great. Thank you.
Tim Harris, um, and this is my build. It is the Star Wars Death Star Trench Run from Episode 4 of Star Wars. And what we have going on, this is one second before the Millennium Falcon swoops in and knocks out the TIE Fighters. So Luke is riding in his Red 5 and he's looking for the secret exhaust pipe to blow up the Death Star. So that's basically what we've got going on. Okay, and there's so much, obviously a lot of gray in this scene because of what you're depicting. How did that work for you? Like getting all those pieces and then deciding where to place them? So um, I raided a lot of my kids' sets. We have no made sets in the house anymore. Um, and then Bricklink, of course, with everyone else, and, and then Lugbulk. Uh, everything was pretty random. Um, everything is built in modular plates, and I would take a 16 by 32 plate, build on it, put it in my closet, forget about it, and then build another one to try to give the randomness to it. So you yeah. don't end up with any you know, weird patterns or something going on where no you're just building the same thing. Which is really nice and refreshing because uh -huh. it's random. And if it breaks, I don't care. You know, it, it just, it's perfect yeah. that way. And so is this all built on plates? You're kind of built up against the sides, or how did that work? Yeah, good question. Um, I like to build modularly so I can transport. And it comes apart in multiple sections. I can show you easily how. So everything comes apart. And so every section is small like that. So I can transport it, stick in boxes. What's really cool, though, is the interior of these. It's just 16 by 16 plates joined together by Technic frames, so it's light to transport. And I pop these Technic frames off, unclip them, and it folds flat, flat packs for storage. So yeah, um, I was pleased to do that. So. Yeah, that's perfect. And what inspired you to do this scene from Star Wars? Just kind of a favorite scene from the movie, or, or how did that work? Yeah, I, I was running out of favorite scenes. Um, so this is definitely one of the ones I thought was iconic. I like to do something that people might enjoy when they walk in. Um, and I designed it so it could be viewed. You can back up from the view, and you can see the, uh, the X-Wing and, and the TIE fighter framed. Um, and then you walk in, and you'll see more that's going on. So it's kind of how I like to build. Yeah, yeah. And you did this at such a large scale, too. I think it turned out really great. What was the yeah. toughest part of doing this for you? Um, really good question. Uh, it was, I had built it. I had it built um, for June to try to take the Brick Fair, Virginia. But I hadn't done this front section. Um, and I didn't do this back section here. It was just kind of flat. And it was a challenge. Do I push through right. and spend the money on doing it? And I, I decided I would to try to make it look good. Uh, yes, a self-challenge was the toughest part, really. So. And when you're working on a build like this, and I know you've done other Star Wars builds and things from movies, is it? are you just looking at screenshots from the movie when you're working on it, or how does that work? Well, screenshots from Star Wars Battlefront. Um, I bought myself an Xbox and Battlefront a year ago, logged over 400 hours. Oh, there you go. That's a lot of research. That's research. Perfect research. So absolutely. <laughs> yeah. But that's it, basically. Okay. Perfect. Yeah, well, I think it turned out great. So great job on the build. Like you said, you know, I think it really gets people involved. A lot of people recognize this scene, obviously. So it's a crowd favorite, I'm sure. Well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I, I hope it is. I hope it's enjoyed. My name is Maciej and I'm from Poland and this is my Endor project. 
that I've been working on for something like 13 years. <laughs> so this is a real passion project. It's a project of a lifetime. So okay. my, uh, my great, great project, I think, the biggest one. Well, it all started with the shuttle uh, in 2004. I built a shuttle with a different cockpit. And then later on, there was a UCS set for collectors based on my model. And then the actual designer of the set, uh, Adam, uh, a Lego designer, uh, he said, well, maybe you should think about something like a little scene for this model. And he meant like just a piece of ground maybe. And I took it literally and built this. So uh, what do you want to know about yeah. all, all the functions? Yeah, yeah. Take us through kind of the, the whole layout if you can here. There's so much to look at. OK, so as you can see, there's um, a little scene from Return of the Jedi uh, with the at, -AT or at at if you prefer. The head should be moving. It's not moving right now, of course. Uh, the head should be moving. The guns are working here. There is, of course, Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. Uh, brand new blinking red lights, as you can see. Uh, uh, I'm rather proud of it that it's 99% uh, Lego. Mm -hmm. There is no like wooden frame under heels. It's all full, full of bricks, actually. So. There are certain metal parts in the platform itself, but they are just in case a child would like to hang on the, on the edge or something. They are not necessary. Some of the lights are LED lights, but most of them are Lego, original Lego lights. Okay. The trees are one meter tall. Um, this is like six, 80, 80 is six or seven kilograms of bricks and, uh, and a horror to set up. <laughs> It looks like it would be. So then talk a little bit more about kind of the platform structure itself. Obviously, you've got a bunch of gray bricks in there holding everything up. Yep. It's all snot built. It's, it's not, there is some Technic uh, bricks that, that are bracing it inside. I mean, uh, uh, the supports, the main supports. Uh, there is a lot of very colorful long bricks inside, of course. But it's all snot built, so it looks nice. It's very solid. You could actually probably sit on the column. Wow. Uh, and then there is a platform itself. It's also not built. Uh, it's strengthened with long uh, Technic parts, but it's smooth on the outside and smooth on the other side, underside. So that was my aim. I didn't want the stud holes or studs mm -hmm. visible. Actually, aside from the ground, you can barely find a single stud in the whole platform. That's it. Yeah, that's fantastic work. So if we move around to the back side okay. then and take a look. Take a closer look at those trees, and then also I think you've built a number of functions in here as well. Uh, not in the trees, actually. <laughs> <laughs> the trees are just trees, and they are a nightmare in, in transportation, because um, I have to strip them down of each and every branch, and store them uh, in layers, okay. and then uh, um, disassemble the trunks in three parts at least, and you know, lots of boxes, really like 15 boxes or something. <laughs> The platform itself has a crate, huge crate, so it is another problem, especially when you don't have a van, and I don't have a van. Mm -hmm. So you got to be able to pack it in all real tight. Yes, it is as tight as possible today, at least, um, but it's still very, very large and ha hard to transport. Well, about the functions, um, there's a control panel. Uh, color-coded, as you can see. Uh, it's because of the sources of energy. Uh, I mean, uh, each, each section of the panel is uh, another source of energy. Uh, there is for one for flying, one for the elevator on the, on the top of the platform. Then there are all the functions for, uh, for the shuttle, which is, of course, motorized. Uh, the wings are moving, the ramp is opening, the landing gear is uh, opening, as you, as you probably saw. Mm -hmm. Okay. Can you, can you give a demonstration of how that works now? Uh, if you can make a, a much faster film, yes, I can, because it, it goes very, very slowly. Okay, okay now the lights first. Um, the wings. Well, they are actually idiot proof, so when they go all the way up, they will not break down. Okay. They will just stop, but I prefer to, to watch them carefully. And we can, I think, Fly down. Flying down goes really slowly because uh, the shuttle is somewhere between two or three kilograms heavy. So now let's open uh, the landing gear. The 
landing gear coming out the bottom. Yeah. Slow descent. Yeah, it has to be slow. It, it has two uh, power functions, XL motors inside to make it really, really strong. But I didn't want to go fast for two reasons. First of all, uh, it's very a lot of strain on the motors. And the other thing is that it wobbles if it goes very, very fast. And I need it to be, to be stable because the strut that is going up is, I would say, not too, uh, not too wide, not too strong. It's all about the balance, actually more than uh, the strength of, of the strut. Okay. So then all the motors are inside the, the gray yeah, yeah. column there? Yeah, yeah. All, the all the mechanisms are uh, in the column, that's right. Except for the shuttle's mechanism, which are packed inside. So that was quite, um, quite hard, actually. There are like four motors inside, or I think four motors inside the shuttle. Okay, and I will not show you the ramp opening because I personally broke it down today. Okay. <laughs> I made it go all the way and then forgot about it. And the power functions, uh, linear actuated, just ripped it off. So. There you there, go. There is a ramp, but you cannot see it now. Well, I think this is plenty impressive already. So excellent layout here. I love the, the years of work you've put into this. I think it definitely shows off here. So appreciate you bringing to the show. Thanks for chatting with me about it. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching Beyond the Brick. Show off your LEGO fandom with our brand new merch line. Link in the description. Now enjoy the video. I'm Jacob. Uh, I'm Josh. Okay. And we built the uh, Genosis Arena here. So this is from Star Wars Episode 2. Yeah, and it's where uh, Obi-Wan, Kenobi, Padme, and Anakin all have to escape from the Genosis reason by, you know, attack, uh, fighting off the monsters as well as the battle droids here. And our inspiration for building is that we've never seen someone do this before in dark tan, only in tan or brown. And we figured this is the best Lego color that matches what the arena actually looks like in the scene of the movie. Mm -hmm. So, And dark tan is such a fantastic color. It just looks so nice when you have a build like this, especially with the kind of rock work and stuff going on there. So how, how did that come together for you guys? What was that like doing all the slopes and everything and kind of the weird angles of that? 
Yeah, so we first kind of started just by doing some general sketches and then taking the base plates and outlining where we wanted the rock structure to be and then just kind of building layer by layer. We built this kind of curve, the curved architecture of each of each one of these stands. So we kind of built these in individual sections, building them up and up until we got to finally about a base point and then we were able to start making the cliffs and the overhang. And one of the biggest challenges of the build is the fact that Dark Tan doesn't really have a wide array of different pieces available in it. So we were kind of constrained to to what Lego actually creates. Yeah, and some of the dark tan pieces also get quite expensive. <laughs> Not So we were kind of limited as, well, you know, we had to figure out on BrickLink what is the cheapest piece, like stud per dollar that we could get. You know, it ended up being a lot of smaller pieces instead of some of the larger ones actually okay. sometimes. So my favorite part of the build was the beasts, the three different creatures. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are impressive. So what are some of the techniques you guys were able to incorporate there? Uh, I think one of the coolest techniques was definitely the teeth. For mm -hmm. <laughs> little white teeth pieces there and then also the legs as well exactly. yeah yeah trying to make sure those you know looking at tons of screenshots from the movie as well as you know looking at other monsters people build and just trying to get, generate ideas for that it was a fun and process the horns for the red beast in the middle that anakin is riding mm -hmm. the gold golden pieces are always impressive you can't go wrong with that yeah <laughs> definitely and so you've got some great minifigs in here as well take us through some of the minifigs that, that are in this scene yeah sure so you have Padme, she's up trying to escape the beast on top of the post. Anakin is actually riding his beast, and Obi-Wan is fending off Akle with a spear. And from the battle droids, you can see that we actually include an Easter egg from the movie. There's C-3PO, his head on top of a battle droid body from when he had to escape the droid factory and accidentally got uh, you know, discombobulated. <laughs> and then we have some of the Jedi in the stands actually appearing just like they do in the movie, they kind of come out of the shadows and as they begin their rescue effort for Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan. And up here, we actually have the visitor stand where Count Dooku, I think some of the Geonesians, uh, Boba and Jango Fett, and you can see in the back, Mace Windu is coming in to surprise <laughs> them. Exactly. I love how you've included all the characters there and gotten it set up just like the, the scene in the movie. That's yeah. that's really neat. So then you've got a bunch of the winged characters there as well. Was it hard to, to source that many for this build? Uh, yeah, we definitely had to go through a couple different sources. And actually, we found it was better to just buy the minifigures and the wings separately rather than buy them all together. So mm -hmm. that was one interesting thing we did. But it, yeah, definitely had to search across a couple Bricklink stores to get this many of those guys. <laughs> And then part of the area here, I like how you you did kind of black filler on the back there. So uh, what, how, what was kind of the reason for that? Did you just want to fill in some of the gaps? It's more that if you look at the arena in the movie, you can see it's kind of, there's these almost uh, like cavern-like structures okay. and caves. So we wanted to give the element that, hey, this goes back way deeper. Yeah, but we also want to make sure, you know, on the sides here, like we had the we had the parts where it was open and exposed to the outside, but as well as you know, having the having the dark caverns as well to kind of give a contrasting effect. Sure. Well, that makes sense. Well, it's an excellent build, and I love the use of the dark tan and everything in here. So thanks so much for bringing it to the show, and thanks for chatting with me, guys. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks for your time. Hi, I'm Austin Henry Biscup. I'm from Western Oregon. Hi, I'm Pamela Henry Biscup. And uh, this is our mock together. Uh, it is the attack on Taco Donna from Force Awakens. It's Maz Kanata's castle. And uh, this is a mock we really wanted to do because we felt like it didn't have a lot of screen time. It was in the movie for a few minutes, and then it just gets blown up by the Empire, sadly. <laughs> so we wanted to learn more about it, and in doing so, we wanted to build it. And uh, starting off over in this area, we... We, w we wanted to have more landscape, you know, involved with it, but the problem is when we were really looking at it, you know, the Falcon would be really far away and in a different area, but there was a pathway, if you remember, that they walked on towards the castle, I guess, and um, I guess we can start with the entrance here. So this was something that was really iconic from the movie. This is probably the main part you see in the movie, and so we really wanted to make this look good and look you know really see what you see in the movie and really authentic. Uh, yeah really yeah and so yeah the the flags were a challenge it's actually one of the last things we did she had the idea of just taking tissue paper and cutting it up and it worked and uh, you know using some lego strings to attach the flags to and we have we have a few lego flags but they're mainly just custom right. so but the other funny thing about the flags is that um, 
he was like, we're going to get on the computer. We're going to do all this crazy stuff. And I was like, no, we're not. We're going to use the photocopier. We're going to go old school. We're just going to copy symbols onto vellum and cut them up. And like, I really love the way that the effect that it ended up with. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I love how you kind of have them all scattered throughout there. Yeah. It gives that, that really nice effect that I think you achieved nicely from the movie. Uh -huh. Well, the other thing is we thought they were all hanging on strings. And then I got on to, we'd taken a bunch of screenshots, and I got on my computer the other day, and I was like, oh, my goodness, those are all on poles. So we were scrambling to find all these poles to hang all these flags in the courtyard. To, we were really trying to make it as authentic as possible, as much as we could within the LEGO universe. And yeah. then up here, I really love, you talk about the statue there some more. I think that's something that's very recognizable when you first walk up to this. Yeah, that was something that I was tasked of doing. <laughs> she didn't want to do it. <laughs> I had to do it. to do it. And yeah. I kind of just, I kind of put it off to the last second. Okay. I think I built that a couple days ago. But luckily, the recent uh, Brickheads sets just came out, and the Robin figure has those, those black pieces, the round eyeglass pieces. Oh, yeah. And so that's where we're kind of like, okay, I'm starting to see it come to shape mm -hmm. more. So, I, re I, you know, I was putting together and I realized, you know, this is a statue, so it doesn't have to be exactly like her. You just <laughs> has to resemble her. So I, I think I kind of took a step back. It's like, I just got to make it look like her. And I'm, I'm pleased with the event. Yeah. Yeah. I think it turned out nicely. And then if you talk about some more, the, you've got all these other big buildings here. And I love maybe point out some of the, de the architectural details and everything and, and how you were able to achieve some of that. Well, the interesting thing is many people might not notice, but all of these walls are at an angle. So it's not a straight up and down Lego build. You have to build the, all, the whole wall and then attach it to um, uh, you know, something so it can pivot. So they're all leaning back. Um, I don't know if you can see that there might be a little, yeah, there's, see, there's a little bit of movement. Um, there are just, there are no right angles on this castle. <laughs> so right from the beginning, we were like, oh my goodness, how are we gonna make this work? Um, because in the Lego universe, everything is pretty right angle, cut and dry. Um, but we just did the best we could, you know, we had to take some liberties here and there, but overall, you know, I think you really get a feel for the castle and I think we, we, we created it to the best of our ability. Right, yeah, and it's some, one cool effect I like up there, you've got some lights and like the explosion there, how, how did you guys achieve that? Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, so that those are all uh, clear studded bricks and then we got a hold of just a huge, really long string of LED lights. And so each tiny little light filament is like stuck inside. They're so small, they fit inside like an actual brick connection. Mm -hmm. um, and we just kept like putting it together and adding colors and kind of making it different shapes. And we weren't even sure if it was gonna work, but in the end, like I think it turned out amazing. You know, it really has that sort of smoldering fire effect. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it was good. You also, I think, achieved the color scheme really nicely. Did you experiment with different colors to try to capture the, the look of the building, or how did that work? Uh, well, we definitely knew we wanted to stay with, uh, within the dark tan realm. Um, if you look at photos from the castle, the, the stones are mainly dark tan, but then there's so much discoloration, I think maybe it's supposed to be from rain and weather and stuff like that. So that's when we got into having like the grays and some of the oranges. You can see in places where we just cheated a little, we had to do green because we didn't have, like we were running out of pieces. Um, but I think overall, it is a very colorful castle when you see pictures of it. And so I feel like that, you know, we really captured it. Um, I, I'm very happy with the, with the final product. Yeah. Is there any kind of interior on the inside or kind of what's the structure on the inside that helps keep this all together? A bunch of colored Lego bricks. <laughs> yeah, no, we, this was actually supposed to be a side project and it got a little bigger than we thought it okay. would. Um, yeah, no, we didn't have time to do interior. It would have been really cool to do, you know, the bar from the movie, but one of the problems we realized that there's so many iconic figures in that that you would see, but Lego doesn't make them yet, so it probably would have been pretty hard to create a lot of the characters that you see mm -hmm. in the movie but yeah that was kind of a sacrifice we had to take but I just don't think we would have had the time to do it right so then how does this thing kind of move around did you build it in sections yeah there are sections um, you, I think you can see a couple of the lines you know there's separation lines along the the floor there um, 
Yeah, in past mocks, we haven't been great about making them easy to move, so we really tried to make sure these were strong pieces, they weren't too big, and we set this up, I think, in probably an hour or so. It was yeah. a pretty quick setup, yeah. Yeah, very. it sustained very little damage and got over here pretty easily. Thank goodness. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, we did a little more planning with this mock because we knew we didn't want to run into problems we've had in the past where you just have so many giant pieces and they're very cumbersome to move and then you get a lot of breakage and so yeah it, it was it worked out good like he said this was supposed to be a small side project which kind of grew out of control um, but it was definitely a labor of love uh, we're huge star wars fans and um you know it just it, it really means a lot to us to, to be able to recreate something so iconic from the movie Sure, and I wanted to make sure there's a couple more cool things we want to point out down here. You've got some nice landscaping here. First off, those tree techniques, how did you achieve that? Well, I'd actually seen a couple different ideas that people had come with trees. I, you know, I really love to see all the different ideas that people come up with because there's so many different ways you can build trees. You can use arches, you can use, you know, you can use be technic beams. There's so many different things I've seen. And one of the things I'd seen a couple, little bit of was using pin connectors, or I guess in this case they're axle connectors, and they're just brown. You know, they're they're, they're like the flattest bend. I think they're not very. They don't have a lot of a bend to them, but you just kind of connect them, and I feel like they gave so much more of a lifelike tree than trying to use arches. And this way, I feel like the branches are attached to the trees rather than, or sorry, the, the leaves are attached to the branches rather than the leaves just being in a swarm around the, the tree that you're building. And so that was something I really wanted to try and make. And actually, a cool thing is, before you put any leaves on, they look like super ominous, creepy, <laughs> like, you know, haunted mansion yeah. trees. So they have so many purposes. And you could build them out of black and make them burnt. Or, like, mm -hmm. I think that's their... Oh, sorry. I think uh, that's a really... It's, it has a lot of potential, that technique, and so I wanted to try that out. Yeah, I particularly love this tree, too. Uh, he got a hold of some of those green whips and just said, I'm going to make a tree, and I, it was, I think it turned out great. I mean, it's kind of crazy looking, but, you know, I love repurposing pieces like that. You know, it's a lot of fun. Right, almost like the weeping willow type of effect. Yeah, yeah. Totally, yeah, completely. Yeah, 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 and I, I think it, it, it looks like an avatar tree. It looks like something <laughs> for avatar. Or, you know, it's a space planet, so mm -hmm. we took some liberties on what the landscape could look like. There you go. And then uh, we've got this iPad sitting here. So you talk about this and kind of the images on here and how that helped you as you were building? Well, uh, Austin found online, this is actually from an ILM 3D model video. Um, I was surprised that somebody released it, but that saved us. I mean, we just really would have never figured out, like, that's the backside. We would have never known what that was back there. You know what I mean? So we could get such uh, up-close detail to make each little piece, which was just... You know, I, I don't think we could have done it without it, honestly. Mm -hmm. And then we just used a lot of screenshots from the movie, you know, um, and we would just constantly reference back to that stuff. I mean, on a daily basis. <laughs> yeah. At, at what point did you guys, it was, were you sitting there kind of watching the movie and right when you saw this scene and kind of saw this building, was it, is that what inspired you to build it or was it later that you were thinking about things to build that you thought this would kind of work well for Lego? I can't remember. Can you, like, well, how did we get onto that idea? I we knew it, we wanted it like we were trying to do a small interim thing. Yeah, we thought it was small. In our heads, we remembered it being small, and then yeah, yeah, looked at the picture. I think that's what we were, it is. Yeah. And the funny thing is, uh, when we started, ref, you know, looking at reference, and when you see a figure in the courtyard, it's actually huge. Yeah. A figure, you know, down in here is like one fifth the size of this wall. Right. So that's when it started to be like, wait a minute, this is not a small castle. No. <laughs> it's actually huge. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, just kind of gradual inspiration as you're looking for something to build then. Yeah. 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 Well, like I said, we're huge Star Wars fans. So, this yeah, I think is our first Star Wars mock that we've done, a big Star That's Wars. True. Yeah. That is true. Right. So you just went right right for the massive build right yeah. off the bat. <laughs> Why start small when you can go huge with the first build? Exactly. Some might accuse us of having a problem with that. <laughs>
What's up guys, I'm Blaine Boffa and I am with Brick Productions. And uh, I'm Anthony, I'm also with Brick Productions. So uh, we built Starkiller Base. So um, it, this was a fun journey, uh, very long. We started back last year in January, about the same time. Uh, but it was just really fun. But I am the funder and then my brother Blaine is the builder. So he did build this whole structure. I just basically provided the funds to do this mock. But uh, yeah, my inspiration obviously came from Star Wars The Force Awakens. Uh, and a lot of people said it was the impossible and uh, I wanted to accomplish that so uh, but it was really fun to do and uh, yeah I mean uh, and also the the hangar bay in the back was uh, really really fun and we, we looked at some other star killer bases of what other people did and we noticed that most of them never did like any extra things so we we thought we'd do a hangar bay in the back so that was really fun to do um, but that's really all I have to say about Starkiller, so. Uh, yeah, I can talk a little bit more about the structure and what was used, but um, so six TIE Fighters straight from the Force Awakens sets, and then the Transporters and the Kylo Ren Strudel is straight from the actual LEGO sets as well. Um, for the minifigures, we actually took them from the First Order Battle Packs, and we actually ordered 64 First Order Battle Packs to do it. So um, there's a total of 437 First Order minifigures in this creation, and then we got the Snowspeeder, or excuse me, the Snow Troopers off of Bricklink.com, um, where I have a store as well, so it worked out really well. But um, the hangar bay was based on like an Imperial hangar bay design, but we didn't want just a podium scene with with troopers. We wanted a little extra and a little, you know, a little more creativity just not many figures out in a formation so we added the hangar bay in the back and it turned out really well um, also the red flags for the banners we customized those and heat pressed them on as, as well as the, the cloth so uh, it worked out really 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 well and then um, we didn't want to have too much gray around the the back so we added the black tiles and the red lines to kind of give it to it kind of separates the gray and kind of pushes out the minifigures a little bit and then the tie fighters on top so um, as far as the structure that it was just light bluish gray bricks and a lot of tile um, over 2,000 just one by six light bluish gray tiles so um, a lot of brick link orders for sure but it, it turned out pretty well so budget was the biggest thing a lot of money but other than that you know it was a it was a great journey a couple not only a couple stressful moments <laughs> nothing too crazy so yeah yeah I think it turned out really nice, and I, I love what you did with uh, the, the minifigs there. When you when you bring this to show and set it up, do you have those kind of preset up, or do you have to set yeah. all those up one by one? Yeah, we preset them, or we don't preset them up. We have actually up under the minifigures um, one by two plates to show where they go because there's so many different formations and squads. Um, there's 48 in the middle squads, and then 30 on on the end. Um, so we have the black one by two plates to show where all the different technician and crewmen are. And then the white um, one by two plates to show where all the stormtroopers and the um, snow troopers were. So we just put them all in bags and set them up. It's easier to transport because we just take the banners off and the troops and uh, just stack the base plates. So it's, it's a lot easier to transport. And the sets will go in a separate box. So it's really not, each base plate comes apart for everything. So a um, total of 12 gray base plates, the big um, 48 by 48 stud base plates. So pretty big. <laughs> Hello, I'm Jalen Edwards, and this is my minifig scale Millennium Falcon. I started with an exterior that a guy named Marshall Banana made online, and my idea was just to fit an interior inside of his design, and then I realized it was a little too flat, so I kind of manipulated it to work it around the interior that I wanted to add into mine, and that's kind of how this model came about. So as you can see, it's the Force Awakens iteration. There's Ray in the cockpit, there's a square um, satellite dish on it, and I think the most interesting thing about this model is um, well, for, first and foremost, probably the inside, but also the fact that the bottom is probably just as detailed as the top. I would love to show you it, but this thing is really heavy, and I'd hate to drop it on camera, exactly. so I'll leave that up to your imagination, <laughs> but I promise you it is there. Um, so, so you I can take sort of the panels off here and yeah, show the interior? It comes apart um, in little sections, and it's nice because everything just kind of sits in there, so there's not any tight stud connections where mm -hmm. I'd tear something off on accident. Yeah, very cool. So all these different parts come off. Yeah, it's kind of, it's honestly, it's, it's, I had to memorize exactly how it can come apart and come back together. Like I've gotten in situations where I'll start putting it back together and I realize, oh no, this other part has to go over it. So then I have to restart. So all of these just kind of 
come off. And I looked at a lot of the cross sections books for the Millennium Falcon to make sure I had at least most of the rooms. I think there's only there's the only main thing I'm missing is there's two rooms in here, but I had to have the Technic structure for the mandibles in the front, so it's kind of hard to implement that. I may eventually end up doing something in here, but um, in the meantime, I have everything that you see on camera, so that was probably the biggest goal of mine, getting everything situated. So as you can see, like in the front main room, there's the couch, and then you can see Han and Chu are finding uh, Ray, Finn, and BB-8 in the little hole in the ground. And then if you come over here, you can also lift this panel up. So when Han wants to smuggle spice, that's where I imagine it would go. And um, if you come like around here, this is the hallway where Chewie and Han would come into the Falcon and say, you know, Chewie, we're home. And then here I actually turn it around. Back around here to the main hallway, this is kind of like a little comm section where it's a lot of panels and electrical things like that. And then this is the hyperdrive room, and this is the scene uh, where C-3PO gets tangled in wires and thinks he's melting. R2 is probably going to help him out with that. And then Han's putting his moves on Leia over there in the uh, cargo room. And then of course there's the hyperdrive back here. And an interesting thing about this is that, like, I guess in the original models of the Falcon, it was just intended that this room would be three different beds. But in the newer versions for The Force Awakens, they changed this to a kitchen and a bathroom. So I thought that'd be a little bit more interesting. So if you guys are ever wondering where the bathrooms in Star Wars were, there's one in the Millennium Falcon. Go figure. Mm -hmm. And then if you come around back over here to this side, this would be the section where Han and uh, Luke would have run into the hallway to the guns at the top and bottom. And I made it to where you can pull this out. So if you want to place a figure in the bottom, you can do that. And then I have Finn over here in the top. I guess technically he should be in the bottom, but it's a lot easier to see it this way. And then finally, over here in this section on the front, that's the bed where when Chewie gets shot, he's sitting down and Finn's trying to tend to him. And I think he almost killed him like six times. <laughs> and then also uh, there's Ray in the cockpit piloting the Millennium Falcon. And as the one little play feature on this, if you look on the side, uh, the bridge can open and close with a Technic mechanism. And if you swing around back, we got the hyperdrive actually functioning. I know how rare it is to see this, but yeah, the hyperdrive is working on the Millennium Falcon. <laughs> you got the lights in there. Was it hard to incorporate the lights? Or? Yeah, it was. Um, the hardest thing is always just like the wires because there's not a lot of space back there. So it was a lot of just figuring out like how they would fit in the little crevices. I mean, it, it doesn't look pretty by any means, but this is really the best way I could get them to all fit in because there's just so many of them that you need to kind of have it look like an LED strip. I wanted to stick with pure Lego elements. Um, so having to tr try to incorporate that was a little difficult. And also, I realized that I had to make it blue somehow. Um, I considered making just the plates on the back all light blue. But one, those are expensive. And two, the Millennium Falcon doesn't look blue on the back when the lights are off. So what I ended up doing was just having blue studs um, right on the other side of the light. So when it shines through, it actually looks blue. But when you turn it off, it just looks, you know, like the normal backside of the Millennium Falcon. Well, that worked really well. So when you first started on this build, where did you kind of start from and build out from as you kind of put, made the stru structure and everything? Right, yeah. So I started out with um, Marshall's exterior, and then I kind of made like a floor in it just to see like if a minifig would be able to stand in it and it obviously couldn't so I went through a bunch of different things and then I just decided okay I want to build a structure like a square big enough to fit in this because it's easy to build squares in Lego and then kind of like see how the panels can fit and hinge into it and it's a lot of really complex angles in this ship so I use one of the techniques I saw in the most recent UCS snow speeder with having the rubber bands kind of keep them anchored to the bottom so that really helped it, um, me out in figuring out how to keep the panels on the bottom connected without figuring out some complex you know geometry for the getting like a stud connection at that weird angle um, and then it was really just a lot of like seeing whether or not this room can fit in here and then like putting the top back on it and seeing like if the top could fit flush on it and if it couldn't taking it back out lowering that section a little bit and then um, at the end it was just like figuring out okay how can I make these panels sit in here and in like a nice and neat looking way and filling in some of the holes so it looks like a decent ship from the outside but still allowing you to be able to access the inside pretty easily. Yeah. Well, I think it came together really well, and I love all the detailed interior in there. That's something you don't see on a lot of Millennium Falcons, so I think that's really neat. Thanks for showing it to us. Appreciate it. Yeah, no problem. I appreciate you for the interview. My name is Runa Lindblom, and I built a Crystal Fox from Star Wars The Last Jedi. So after watching The Last Jedi movie, I fell in love with this creature. I thought it was a very visually impressive creature. 
And as I was trying to think of a good idea to build for this year's Brickvention, I thought I'd have a go at trying to build this. So I kept it a secret because I thought it was going to be very challenging. And I was correct, but I did manage to pull it off and I'm quite happy with it. And you captured it so well, so you're using pieces in kind of very strange angles and strange ways here. So talk about kind of the challenges of that and how this build came together for you. Yeah, so that was something that I was um, considering when I was thinking about it, was how I was going to get a lot of the trans clear pieces to set at different angles to kind of give that effect of being the crystals like the creature actually has. And so I've used a lot of um, brackets and plates and all sorts of interesting pieces to try and get that effect. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, what were some of the main uh, clear pieces that you used here that you found kind of gave a nice uh, perspective on the creature? Um, I'm not 100% sure what the technical terms for them are, but um, these blade pieces, they were quite important. Okay. And also the little antenna pieces. So there's not a lot of them in Australia, so I did have to pick up, um, pick up them from Europe. Um, Is yeah. that like Bricklink orders from European sellers? Yeah, okay. Lots of, lots of Bricklink orders. <laughs> I'm sure that shipping and stuff gets expensive coming to Australia. Yeah, yeah. it was quite a lot of shipping. So mm -hmm. I think one seventh of the cost was shipping. Wow. <laughs> but you know, you needed a lot to, to give that nice effect here. So then beneath the clear pieces, it's pretty much just all white pieces is kind of the base and the main body. Yep, that's correct. Mm -hmm. There is yeah. a little bit of color in there, of course, <laughs> as you're trying to fill bits in you just pull out whatever pieces you've got available mm -hmm. um, yeah but um, the white was quite easy to come by so it was a nice color to work with mm -hmm. and then you even incorporated some lighting in the head there so how did you achieve that uh, I've got a little hidden compartment in the torso so the back lifts off where I've got the Lego battery box connected to the little two light uh, diode pieces so it was, it was very complex. Just, you know, connect one piece to the other and stick it in. It was, it was great. <laughs> and that, that part was easy for you? <laughs> yeah, that was quite straightforward. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. so what's this like structurally then? You've got the base there you built for it. Can you pick it up off of that and move it around? Or when you bring it to the show, how does, how does that work? So I've connected it onto the base plate. So its legs are stuck. I was kind of tossing up a few ideas of whether or not I actually stick it down or just let it stand. And um, given the weight of the body on the legs, um, I did decide to actually stick it down onto the base plate. So the head comes off, um, all of the trans clear pieces come off, and the tail, and then I can lift it up underneath to carry it. Mm -hmm. Very nice. So is this type of building, sort of creature building like this, something you've done in the past, or was this your first attempt at this style of build? Well, I actually only got into Lego in 2016. I came to Brickvention for the first time and was absolutely astounded and went, <laughs> I have to do this. Um, and then in 2017, I started off by building a brick-built Spyro the Dragon model. Mm -hmm. And so that was my first um, ever attempt at building with Lego. Um, well, at least, you know, I'd bought a couple of small sets since Brickvention, but yeah, so um, just amassing all the bricks and building it. Um, I did use the original Lego Green Dragon just as a little template for the back legs and then just kind of built off from that and so that was kind of my learning process and then you know I've kind of tried a few other builds since then. But, yeah. yeah, I think your skills have advanced very quickly here. This is a really impressive build and you even won an award for it there as well so congratulations on that. It's, very, it's really great. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Zach Schrader um, and this is my uh, Battle of Crate made out of Lego. I tried to do something different than what I've seen for, from a lot of other uh, LEGO crate mocks. I tried to do some uh, custom speeders that were more in scale with the uh, custom walker that I built. Um, I really wanted to capture the look of the speeders from the movie, so I added a couple extra details that aren't found in the LEGO set. And I wanted to add some different colors just to give some variation. And then I wanted to add the uh, black Kylo Ren shuttle because it's a very iconic scene in the movie with the color contrast on, on the whole planet and salt crate during the battle. Um, I really liked the look of the black and the red, of course, uh, in the movie. And then I also, of course, did a, a custom walker, um, which is one that you can uh, see that's much bigger than the uh, at -80s. Uh, in the movie, so I wanted to capture the size comparison. That's why I have the AT-AT in the mock as well. 
Um, and then of course I did light everything on the mock to really add another level and layer to the mock. Um, and then I went ahead and I um, added a lot of like broken, you know, salt and dirt from the planet around all the feet to add some more texture and detail to the mock. And of course we have the, uh, the footprints from the troops walking because in the movie you see that when anybody walks on the planet it leaves a red footprint where it wiped the, dust, the uh, salt away off the planet. So I tried to add that detail too. And then my uh, friend Josh, who's also in my lug here, he helped me uh, build a cannon for the mock. Um, and we lit the barrel as well. And unfortunately right now the battery ran out on the inside, but the inside cannon spins as well. Um, and that's really cool and a lot of people really appreciate that. Um, and we also have the uh, command center on that lit as well. And then in the movie, um, in the battle scene, uh, the Falcon shows up uh, to help fight off the uh, fight off all the Tie Fighters that are attacking the Speeders. So I wanted to capture that in the mock as well. So I also added the Falcon above the Crate Mountain because it's such an iconic ship in the Star Wars movies and in the scene when it's flying in to help save uh, Crate from the TIE Fighters that are taking over and attacking the Ski Speeders. It's a really great scene in the movie. Uh, I got Chewbacca piloting it, um, like, just like in the movie, and I tried to do some flashing lights for cannon fire and the engine to kind of show some detail on that as well. Um, I really liked um, how the trenches ended up coming out. I did some grading and I did a lot of detail work to kind of show the rock and the broken look of the trenches in the movie. Um, I do have tunnels. Unfortunately, I wasn't able to get tunnels all the way through the whole mock and have like a side cut out. That would have been a really cool level. Maybe next year, always. Um, but I really liked um, how um, I was able to get the troops lined up at a good height on the mock, which of course required the whole mock to be raised up quite a bit. But it was worth it in the end, I think, for the overall look of it. Right. What, what is that like underneath there to get the whole build raised up? What kind of sort of filler brick did you go with? Um, I went ahead and used regular Lego brick instead of like Duplo or something like that. Um, I did um, stacks of brick every, probably about every uh, three to two inches. I, there's a stack of bricks up, up, up. And then it's mostly done with two by two bricks for the bottom of the stack and then a two by four brick at the top um, to hold up. Uh, most of it, the surface is done plated with um, 4x6 plate. Uh, I found a lot of that on the pad wall at the time, and so I went ahead and had 4x6 uh, red plate underneath all of the white that you see done for the salt technique. And then you've got the giant mountain, which is certainly another iconic part of, yes. of Crate. So talk about both kind of the rock work as well as the large gate itself. Sure, sure. Um, I was really uh, worried about how that was going to come together when I was building. I had no idea how fast that was going to come together. The, um, the wall itself came together actually very quickly. I was able to come up with a really fast skeleton design in the back. Uh, I know for some high structures a lot of people use Technic. I was actually able to get away with using all just regular brick and not having to do like a ton of like filler brick in there. I was able to do a technique where I have these uh, two by four bricks. Uh, spacing out the uh, slope bricks and on the back of those I have um, bricks holding up as a structure brick on the back and it connects all the way up the wall kind of like a staircase a backward staircase all the way up the wall and then the rock work um, is a little bit more <laughs> structured on the inside but on the outside I wanted to really include the look of the salt kind of growing and collecting on the rock as it was blowing over time and then of course the iconic red from the movie I re um, the the red the contrast between the red and the white is such an important part of that scene in the movie and I really wanted to capture that in every aspect on the mock and that contrast is I think what really makes crate builds like this stand out so much and yes. are so so cool to look at because of that the bright white and the bright red that really yes. stand out. Yeah, and I think that uh, another thing that helps with that, of course, is when I did the red lighting, that was so important to me to do red lighting on a lot of it. I mean, it is that way in the movie, of course, but the red lights help bring out that pop against the white because when the crowd is looking at it from over there and they look in at it, they see that white backdrop on all of the bright red and it looks really nice. And that lighting definitely makes a lot of this stand out as well. So talk about how you incorporated that in there and what are some of the things you kind of learned along the way that you might be able to, to tell other people that want to add some lighting to their builds. Sure, sure. So the hardest lighting uh, to add, of course, was I think the cannon fire on the ATM-6 over there. Because um, the biggest thing that 
the hardest thing, I guess, with lighting is to hide wiring always. You have to try to find a clever way to hide the wiring. And when it's all the way out there in a brick, uh, you have to try to find a way to run the wire back all the way up through the build and try to keep it concealed. So the biggest, I guess, suggestion I can give to people who want to incorporate wiring is try to plan ahead with your build. If you think you're going to incorporate lighting into the build ahead of time before you know you're going to get started, try to keep that in mind when building the build. I didn't know I was going to add campfire. I knew from the get-go I wanted to do interior lighting and I wanted to do the cockpit in red. So I kind of had a planned path for where I was going to run wire through the whole build. Um, and then for the, the, the cannon fire came later, but I was able to run it through some, some Technic um, spacers and stuff like that to help give it a really hidden look throughout the build. And then the, uh, the big lighting inside the cannon here as well, uh, how, how did that work? The cannon lighting, luckily with the cannon, we were able to get away with a, uh, just a really hollow skeleton on the inside using a lot of Technic. Um, and then the lighting itself was able to all be set up behind the, uh, the cannon barrel there. And then we were able just to run the wires behind the brick right up onto the uh, inside of the cannon to give it the really nice lit fit, lit, uh, lighting effect. And then with the motor, we were able to put that back inside the skeleton as well. So that really helped. The, the size of the cannon definitely lends itself to being able to put in a lot of motors. And actually right here is Josh. He's the one who, uh, who designed the cannon and helped build it all. Great. Yeah, it, it did an excellent job on that part as well. So then when you bring this to the show, what's your setup process like uh, as you're getting this ready to display to the public? Um, the setup process was pretty quick. I was able to break it down and um, put it in crates. So this came in a huge, the, the mountain itself pulls apart um, from the rest of the build and it goes in a giant wooden crate that I was able to build and then all of these sections here break down into the 48 by 48 base split Lego base plate sections besides that side which has a couple of the um, 32 by 32 but it breaks down and it's held together by Technic pins just like a modular building would be uh, on the bottom so it all clips together and comes together really fast actually at the show the biggest thing of course is getting the mountain here because it has a lot of weight to it with all the brick inside of it Right. You got to be careful that doesn't all crumble apart when yes, you're coming to the we, show. Actually, we, we, had a, we had quite a scare when we unpackaged it from the box. We saw that part of the front of the, of the uh, wall had caved in slightly, and that was definitely a scare for everyone, but we were able to get it back together in time for the show. There you go. And I think uh, Josh just uh, added a motor in to the cannon there, so uh, is it working now? It is not spinning oh, okay. right this second. I don't know if he turned it on. <laughs> I can tell him, Josh. It is not quite spinning yet here. It is not. This is this is the challenges of adding uh, lights and ac motor action. And motor action, always. There we go. It was stuck a little bit. So now we've got it spinning in there. It looks a lot better with it spinning, I think, and it adds a lot of detail to the cannon. Um, it looks really nice overall with the build. Right. It definitely adds some nice detail there. So excellent work with this. I think you captured Crate really well. And adding all the lights and the, the action, like the spinning cannon, uh, certainly uh, make it different than some of the crate builds we've seen in the past, yes, so good that work. Was, that was a big goal for me. I, I knew that a lot of people were going to be building this, of course. Everybody wants to build the big seat battle scene in the new Star Wars movie, and I had to work on this for oh, oh, close to two years just collecting bricks, and it was always a, a challenge. You know, what, what can I do differently? What can I do to separate myself? And that's, again, why I went with some of the custom speeders to match some more scale, and we wanted to do a cannon because I haven't seen very many cannon builds, so we, we thought that was really important to capture the look of the cannon on it on crate too because that thing is just massive in the movie exactly thank you so much for bringing it out to the show here yeah, no problem thank you for coming over to check it out